Finding Happy, Seven Steps to Relationships That Will Not Steal Your Joy is the new book by me, Nikita Banks, a licensed psychotherapist and life strategist. Leverage the knowledge you'll receive in this book to help you with the process of obtaining absolute clarity through the use of guided self-exploration. This process is necessary to help you master all your relationships in 2019 and beyond. Go on Amazon.com or BlackTherapistPodcast.com and grab your copy of the book guaranteed to help you redesign all your relationships based on two basic principles, health and happiness. Get your copy today. Welcome to the Black Therapist Podcast. The Black Therapist Podcast is a podcast where we discuss the unique issues people of color face when dealing with mental health issues and mental health diagnosis. Now, if you are new to our show, I am your host, author, life strategist, and psychotherapist, Nikita Banks, in private practice in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. I am available for both psychotherapy and coaching sessions, and you can find more information about that on my website, NikitaBanks.com. You can listen to our podcast everywhere podcasts are found, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, YouTube, SoundCloud, Pippa, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and BlackTherapistPodcast.com. If you are a mental health advocate or a therapist and you want to buy our podcast merchandise, you can do so by visiting our site. And if you want access to our free mental health tips, free online trainings, discounted selective services, and resources, do so by joining our mailing list by texting "get happy" all one word to six six eight six six. If you love the podcast, please like, comment, and share. We love to hear from you, and if you want to send me some feedback, guest suggestions, or simply to say hey, you can contact us at our website, BlackTherapistPodcast.com. Please be mindful that this episode and all of the information that we provide here is just a resource and a tool to help get you started on your mental health journey. If you are feeling any mental health distress or you are having any significant issues, please feel free to reach out to us so that we can find you a mental health provider in your area. Okay, let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Black Therapist Podcast. Okay, so I feel like I have so much to talk about. Uh, for me personally, it is week two of my quarantine. Um, I don't remember if I said this last week. Please forgive me if I'm repeating myself. I told you guys I do not listen to past episodes usually. I listen when I'm editing and I only edit for like clips, social media stuff. That's it. And I haven't edited a show in... I don't think I've edited a show this season, to be honest with you. I've just been kind of throwing stuff stuff up or editing for sound quality or whatever. So, so um, I had been in the house for almost, okay, I say like maybe three days out of the week. So the, the way I, I work right now in my practice is, and in my, so I, I have my private practice. I also have a consulting business. In my private practice, I'm usually in the office three to four days out of the week. Um, the reason is, be, you know, I just, I don't want to get burned out. Usually I can't take any more than seven clients a day and that's combined <laughs> before I start getting a little crazy. There's been in the past where I've seen more than 11 patients in a day um, or patients and clients, right? So I, I use the term patient when a client is inpatient or in a medical facility. And I use the term client when there is somebody who just has like mental health issues, right? So an inpatient visit would mean that the person has a mental health diagnosis. A client that I see in community may just be somebody who has high life issues and they just kind of need, you know, a skill adjustment, right? And so, I usually don't like to see any more than seven patients a day total. And sometimes that's a realistic goal and sometimes it's not. So what I like to try to do is at least work two days out of the week, uh, doing the weekdays in my office. I try to work three days out of the week doing my consulting work. And then I do uh, weekends in my office. So it goes by pretty quickly. My my schedule is usually pretty full and doing my consulting clients. So I try to really be home maybe two to three days out of the week. 
right? I need to have one weekday in case I have like errands to run or things that I need to do. You know, sometimes you need to do like grown up things, doctor's appointments, those kinds of things. And you just need a weekday to do it. So I like to give myself one day on the week. I only have one day on the weekend. And then one day I do billing and office work. So previously, that seemed like a whole long thing to tell you about my life that you probably didn't care about. <laughs> uh, so previously, in the, the week before last, I had gone out a few times throughout the week, but I was home the majority of the week. I had heard about coronavirus. I knew that this whole thing was happening. I didn't really know that it was going to become this bad, but I had already been taking precautions. Plus, I've been traveling more in the beginning of this year than I usually do. I went to Africa. I traveled, you know, in the United States for the, over the last few months. I went to North Carolina, went to Virginia. I had been kind of back and forth all over the place. So, um, and I'm an avid news watcher. I consume news like nobody else's business besides it was like my mother and my father. My father is the kind of person who will wake up and read three papers a day before the sunrise. It was ridiculous. I'm not that bad. But I kind of heard rumblings of this. And, you know, I traveled internationally. So I, I saw a few things that was happening. So my house was pretty prepared for this even to the point that I bought an N95 mask last year and I don't know why I don't know if it was just my ancestor stuff my intuition I bought it because I remember needing a mask for something and then I remember feeling like I needed to take that mask back so I still had it in the pack never used it or anything but clearly I still have it so um I was home went to a, a funeral um uh, a week ago this Friday and come home Saturday I get a notice that somebody who was at the funeral had come in contact with a family member who has tested positive for coronavirus now first of all I was like wait a minute how are you getting a test for coronavirus because it's pretty young and everybody was like oh no there are no tests clearly there was tests he got a test but um, he also worked in an environment where um, people have tested positive, right? So, um, I mean, I guess I could say he worked for the Barclays Center. Barclays Center, one of the executives have it. For the, the New York Knicks have it. So it was, it was, it was a thing. So I was kind of worried, but I had spoken to my doctor. Um, I felt like I didn't really need to worry. A lot of my clients are, are a lot of my patients, I'm sorry, a lot of my patients who have high risk mental health issues, whether they're substance abuse or whatever, or comorbid issues, what ends up happening is that the majority of them don't live on their own. They live with the elderly parents. Sometimes I go to my clients' homes and until I'm I'm like there, like sometimes I get to see their admit clinical or their discharges and I get to see what issues they have. But sometimes it's not until I'm speaking to the client do they tell me that they're HIV positive or that they have diabetes or that there are other issues that are going on. And so not knowing anything about the virus, I was like, let me go take my behind home because Saturday I'd actually had seen a patient in my office. My office is pretty big. We were social distancing in my office. I always social distance <laughs> in my office. I'm never sitting like right next to my patients. So there was really no, no issue with that at that point. Um, but I had decided that I was not going to see clients in my consulting job until I figured out what my, what the risk was. Um, so I had been home for a few days. That Monday I called my office and my office was like, hey, we're probably going to go to telephonic stuff. We're going to shoot out shooting you an email on Monday in the consulting job. I'm like, cool. I really wasn't all that concerned with my clients in my private practice because we had already started to move to a telephonic telephone sessions. And because of that, because of me traveling so much, Throughout the last year, some of my clients were um, used to it. Some of them were open to it and hadn't hadn't tried it yet. 
And so I just kind of was like, let me let me see how I'm feeling about it. Monday, I got a message. It did not say what I thought it was going to say, which is, hey, we're all moving to telephonics. So I just decided, you know, what, I'm going to take a few days off. And so by Friday in my consulting job, they decided that we were going to go telephonic. Schools had closed. You know, things were moving to the the point where, hey, we're really going to uh, um, a quarantine situation. And so I had used the days that I had off, although I saw certain clients telephonically. But I used the time that I took off to do some things that I needed to do, which was like go grocery shopping. I had food in the house, but I don't typically buy like, you know, two months worth of food. I don't live that life anymore. So I went grocery shopping. I ran errands. I, you know, I had cleaning products in the house, but I wanted to get a few more things. I had like Lysol in my house. I stole from my old job. Shout out to my old job. (laughs) So Lysol is not a a cleaning product that I generally use in my house. I don't know who really uses Lysol. Lysol and hand sanitizer is like one of those things. Like I use Lysol now to like clean things in my vehicle, to clean things in my, you know, in, in the house, spray down like cabinets and stuff. I used to use it in the bathroom. Lysol is really not one of those things that I use in my bathroom. My bathroom, usually I use bleach and that's just it or like ammonia, those kind of things, just other general cleaners. But sometimes You know, I'll use like natural stuff for the most part in the house. So Lysol wasn't a thing that I really used. I had more than enough hand sanitizer because I don't know why I buy it so much outside of the fact that I do my nails. Um, Shout out to all of you girls who are home doing your hair and your nails. Thank God for Janice Cott. Uh, 11th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade cosmetology. I'm a licensed cosmetologist. I have been for over 20 plus years. Because my mother told me, if you're going to take the damn class, you might as well get a trade. And so cosmetology was my backup career. And so it's the reason that I basically have like a hair salon in my house. I think I'm a a borderline esthetician. So I've been really kind of practicing my self-care in this. So on the one hand, I feel like I'm doing well with this quarantine right I kind of feel like I'm enjoying this a little bit more than most people I don't feel bad about not going outside right I don't feel bad about sleeping in I I just listen to whatever my body is telling me to do I have allergies I took my flu shot I'm really being proactive about monitoring symptoms that I do have of course I have allergies, so I have a cough, right? I have asthma, so there's some, a little bit of shortness of breath sometimes. I have um, body aches sometimes. Hello, I'm over 40. So, like, there's just certain things that are, like, regular normal stuff. It's like, this is me every day. If I'm looking at these COVID symptoms, this could be me all, any day, right? But I don't have a dry cough, I don't have, you know, I don't have symptoms that can only be COVID. I definitely don't have symptoms of a flu. And I did take my flu shot this year, um, which makes sense. Uh, Like when this whole COVID thing first happened and they were like, oh, take a flu shot. I'm like, why do you need a flu shot if it doesn't protect you from this? But common sense would dictate that if you took the flu shot, and you go to your doctor and you say, hey, I'm having symptoms of the flu. They already know that you don't have the flu because you took the flu shot. Right. So it's just kind of like process of elimination and diagnose and diagnosing, which makes sense. Um, I've seen a lot of people state that they don't believe that you should wear masks. You know, the, this virus from what. All of the doctors are saying, I am not a doctor. I'm not giving you medical, uh, my medical opinion, but I'm just going to give you my own common sense approach to me trying to stay healthy when I go outside to the grocery stores. I live in a heavily Jewish population 
area. Um, I've seen a lot of people in the Jewish community where I live at gathering. I won't say a lot. I'll say it's like 50-50, right? 50% black people who are, are gathering. Although Friday when I went out to um, the store, it wasn't Friday. Last week when I went out, because I only went outside to run errands one day. My mother's making masks for first responders and essential personnel, which is a lot of my family. Um my nephew, my god sister, my sister, uh, my brother-in-law, my niece. So a lot of them still have to go outside to work. Thank God I'm not one of those people who have to go outside in the community anymore to work. But my mother was making masks. I had elastic. Elastic sold out everywhere. Everybody's making masks. So I had to go and drop that in the mail for her. And I just ran some errands, picked up some um, medication for myself and my son some just refills of like allergy meds and crap. So um, the black people that I saw that were outside of my community really made me proud because they were social distancing. And sometimes us, I'm going to speak about us, sometimes we could be a little hard headed. I've seen a lot of, you know, conspiracy theorists on the interwebs. One guy put up a post that said, if you're going outside with a mask and glove, unfriend me. I don't know why anybody else trying to protect themselves, whether it's real or imagined, it bothers you so much. If somebody else is going outside with a mask and a glove on, I don't care. I, I, I actually, when I went outside the, uh, the other day, I was very shocked. First of all, I have masks in my house. I have the N95 and I have the regular surgical mask. I don't know if they're surgical masks, but little regular cheap little masks they have at the hospitals. I steal them from the hospitals when I go in there. I don't steal them. They're at the front door. But I take at least two of them when I was there. I bought some of them. The 99 cent store used to sell them before. I don't know if they'll sell them again. But I buy them because I do my own nails. And when I'm, like, filing my nails, like, I do acrylics and, like, like I do complicated, like, nail art now. <laughs> nail art now. I still think I'm in high school. Lord, help me. Um, but I do my nails. I, I put the mask on because... Um, Towards the end of last year, October, November, I think I've said this previously before, but I was having respiratory issues, which made me go to a pulmonologist. And at that time, she was like, you know, giving me a stress test and all these other tests to make sure that my lungs were were good. And so she had put me on a new medication. And so just to be proactive, I started to wear a mask when I like filed my nails down and stuff like that. So. Um, but I don't like masks. Um, number one, I've been congested this week because of allergies. Number two, I feel, get claustrophobic, so I don't like putting that stuff on my face. N- and number three, as I was outside, everybody had on masks, which made me feel like I didn't need a mask. Because I'm like, if you got on a mask, then I don't, I don't need a mask because you got on a mask. But I'm not above wearing a mask. My mother has made several masks and I sew a little bit. So I was going to make some for people that I knew. I was going to make one for my son. And so um, that was another reason why I went out. I went to go get fabric for masks. So I think if you're going to wear a mask, right, it only makes sense that it's a good idea, right? Like, the this virus from what I'm on, from what I understand it enters in your eyes it enters through your nose it enters enters through your mouth right and usually it's a situation where either somebody's speaking to you or they cough or they sneeze and they're spit and it travels right or there's an incident where you touch something and then you touch your face or you touch your mouth a lot of us are not hypersensitive or hypervigilant that's the word hypervigilant about the the things that we touch and touching our face I rub my eyes a lot which is why I wear glasses when I go outside now just to protect my eyes um the mask would cover your nose and your your face people talk to you they spit it's not like it's it's on purpose right no I've never been outside yet where somebody is like coughing all over the place but I have been outside where like people are spitting on the ground and stuff and it's just gross and I don't like it and so yeah my goal is to be able to be outside with a mask on and not pass out
<laughs> because I don't like masks. But I mean, I think this this the shaming that people are doing to other people about how they decide that they want to keep themselves safe is ridiculous. I think I've seen people just bragging on social media about buying cheap tickets to God knows where about God knows what. And I mean, while yes, you can probably get a twenty dollar ticket to ten buck to right now. Do you really want to take your American ass and your germs and, and your stuff over there and endanger a whole nother country with your stuff? Like in your mess, it just does not make any sense right now. The the smart muddy is that a lot of us who are doing what we need to do, we're keeping a clean house. We're wiping off our surfaces. We are keeping our hands in everything else out of our face and eyes and nose and mouth when we're outside, right? If we are very careful and we're using our hand sanitizer as a as a plan B if you're outside and there is no water, but soap and water is your first choice. Like if you're doing the things that you need to do, there will be outside in a few months. Like there will be something there'll be time for all of this. Like, I just can't imagine the selfishness of other people who just feel the need to be like, it's my life. I'm going to do what I want to. And I don't give a damn about anybody else. Right. I often speak on this show about autonomy. And to me, more than I want to be free um, with money or like finances or with my time, I want freedom of choice. I want to be live an autonomous life. But just because you have the right to choose to be selfish, it doesn't mean that you have to do that all the time. I think the the main goal out of this time period is social distancing and social responsibility. I think those two things go hand in hand. And I think that those are the themes for the day. When I say social distancing, I think social distancing is a gift. (laughs) And I don't mean the concept of being six feet apart from other people. I mean, the concept of being able to choose who you want to engage with and how. Having this idea that you will engage a person when and how you are emotionally ready, how you are uh, spiritually ready and how it suits you and how you can do so in a way that brings you your best self and lends them to offer to you their best self is amazing. And I think that right now, this is a time of intention, right? You have to intentionally teach yourself not to touch your face. But if you have on a mask, right? You have to move the mask in order to get to your face. That would be an intentional act instead of it being an automatic act. I sneeze, I automatically put my hand to my nose. I know that people, you're supposed to sneeze in your elbow. I'm I'm old school. I've learned my hand and my nose. It just happens automatically, right? So, I mean, you have to be intentional about the things that you do. If I'm going outside and I have my glasses on, which I don't wear all the time, but I do wear them when I go outside now, I have to physically move my glasses in order to get to my eyes if they itch. So it's intentional actions. Every single thing that we do right now, we have to move intentionally. If you decide that you are going to have somebody come into your home, that that, that is a Not only an intentional decision, but that's something that you really need to ask yourself. Is this necessary that this person come into my home? Is this person essential to my life right now? Are they a danger to to myself and my family? You know, my girlfriend, she's going through a lot. She wanted to come over to borrow some stuff. And I was like, "Ooh, girl, mm, I'll come to you. (laughs) because it was easier for me to go and meet her somewhere to give her the item that she wanted to borrow. And I love her dearly. So I would give her anything, but to give her the item that she wanted to borrow instead of me allowing her to come into my home and me having to clean the whole house. 
I got to clean the bathroom again. I got to clean the doors off again. I got to see where she sits. Hope she don't pick nothing up. No, ma'am, I'm going to come to you. Number one, it made for a better gesture because she really, she needs me, right? That I would offer to go to her. And number two, I just, I couldn't have anybody in my home right now because my son has previously in the past had pneumonia. And I don't know about anybody else, but when you can see your child in a hospital, sick, and can't breathe, struggling to breathe, it is not only heartbreaking, it's devastating. So, so this whole thing about COVID, I understand that, yes, they're saying 60-year-old people are, you know, high risk, you got to be sick or have cancer or have a suppressed immune system, diabetes, all of that's cute. But the nurse that died here was 40 years old and he had asthma. I'm in, I'm in my 40s and I have asthma. My son is 22 years old and he has asthma. No, I'm sorry. I, I have to make sure that I'm hyper vigilant about what I do to make sure that he's healthy. At least if it's in, if it's within my control. If it's within my control, I'm not going to my elderly clients homes. I'm not going to my my therapist who's a, who's older. I'm not going for a therapy session with him. I'm not going to visit my mother. I'm like, I'm not doing any of these things. And I thank God because I recently went to see my 82 year old uncle, my 70 something year old aunt and my 80 year old aunt for her birthday in actually February 29th. And while we were there, they were like, you know, you took a plane here. It's coronavirus. Like they were already aware. <laughs> like is there's a coronavirus. And I'm like, sis, I have three hand sanitizers. I wash my hands whenever I go into anybody's home. The, I don't want anybody coming in my house, touching things. If they, they, they don't wash their hands. I don't. I, one of the things in my family, the general rule is if there's a baby in the house, if you have a baby, you don't come in off the street and pick up my baby. You don't come in off the street and touch my child. You don't come in off the street and put them directly on your clothes. You you use a but receiving blanket and then you lay my baby on your stuff like you just don't come up in off the street like it's a habit. But my sister was like. A, a, like a, a Nazi when it came to those those kind of things so like I was trained my sister more than my mother my mother's the same way like you're not just gonna go in nobody's home and go in a refrigerator never ever ever is gonna happen never but um you know I hope that you guys are being careful about your intake I hope that you guys are being intentional with with your movements. I hope that you guys are taking care of your anxiety level. Anxiety and stress depresses and suppresses your immune system. So if you're stressing out about that light bill, they ain't going to cut your lights off. Because if you're in New York, because New York State said no. Right. I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't pay my light, my, my light bill. I didn't pay my, my light bills paid, guys. But I didn't pay my cell phone bill yet because I, for some reason, I forgot to pay it last month when I was traveling. So I paid it for the previous month in the beginning of the month. So I would have technically had to pay two months this month. They're not going to cut me off because they already sent me a message that said they're not going to cut me off. They'll get the money next week. I'm not even stressing out about it. And this ain't about that I don't got the money. It's just that it ain't that important to me right now. Sorry, at and It's not a priority. Like, like the things that you can control in an uncontrollable situation, control. And the things that are out of your control in an uncontrollable situation, let it go. I want you guys to practice being kind to yourself I want you guys to not really concern yourself with what you can't concern yourself with. If your boss didn't get that memo, if they're complaining about something that they wanted you to do that usually would have been done immediately if you wouldn't have slept in late because you were working from home or if you were doing things differently because you would have been in the office. Say sorry and move on. 
Don't be arguing with folks that you don't got no business arguing with. If your income has decreased or there are bills that need to be paid, as long as you have breath in your body and you can call them and and make a, a payment arrangement or that you can tell them what your situation is or that you can defer it, please do so without shame. If you got to go down to the welfare office and get a one shot deal or go to social, well, social security is closed. I don't even know if the welfare is off, office, office is open. I'm sure it's all online. Do whatever you need to do. Put your pride aside and take care of your family. Take care of your family. And if you are a mental health provider and you have seen your practice decline, if your clients are deciding that they don't want to see you, um, what is it, t- tele-mental health or they don't want to, you know, do telephone sessions or online sessions or whatever, it's nothing you could do about it. Hopefully you have financially prepared for this time. Thank God I have financially pre- prepared for this time. But guess what? I am no stranger to being backed up in my bills. And they will get it when I got it and not a minute before. And they will get it when it becomes a priority to me. I've learned to do what I can do and what I can't do, I can't do. And so I'm asking that each and every one of you be kind to yourself. Do what you need to do in this moment to Take care of yourself. My nails and my toes will always be done. I don't know what what it has to do with anything, but I feel like all is right with the world. If I look down on my hands and my my fingers are painted, I I feel like a a shiny new penny. If I get up in the middle of the night and I go to the restroom or something and I look down and my toes are are, are painted, they need to be painted right now. But I'm going to get to that when we get finished. But, um, you know, it's. It's the little things that you can do in this moment that creates normalcy and that helps reduce your anxiety will be important things for you. Boost your immunity right now. Uh, If you got vitamins, take them. If you already got your flu shot, great. If you, you know, are looking into taking care of your respiratory health, if you have asthma or any respiratory issues, if you have a nebulizer machine, clean it. My son has one in the home. I, I cleaned it because, you know, I was literally just watching something where there was an ER doctor. Shout out to Tamron Hall, who had did like a uh, Instagram. What is it? A live video where she was talking to some fine ass doctor, Dr. Cutie Pie. I don't know his name because I really wasn't paying that much of attention. But he did mention that usually when someone comes in into the hospital with respiratory issues, what they do is they use a nebulizer and they are not using nebulizers right now because if you use a nebulizer or a COPD machine, what it could do is it would aerate the virus and it would actually make it go all over to other clients and other patients and the doctors as well. So they're not even using that in the hospitals. But if you have one at home, by all means, it's yours. If something happens and you're having issues with breathing, make sure you have your albuterol, make sure you have your medication, make sure you have your steroids, make sure you are taking your allergy meds and everything so that you can get a reduction to of all of the symptoms that look like symptoms that could be COVID so that you're not walking into these hospitals and saying that you have COVID. I am seeing my clients in my consultation jobs. These are clients that have come out of the psych EDR Um, and a lot of them are, I want to say every last one of them mentioned to me something about COVID this week, every last one of them. And a couple of them ended up in the ER because they were paranoid that they had COVID symptoms. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to see more of that. So if you have psychiatric issues, severe or not that severe, what you definitely need to be doing right now is being being vigilant about taking your medications if you're they're prescribed, take taking your um seeing your psychic psychiatrist if you have one, 
calling your therapist and your mental health providers so that you are getting your sessions and being consistent. If you go every Wednesday, go every Wednesday online. I'm not telling you go outside, but go online every Wednesday. Try to keep as much normalcy in your life as you possibly can. I usually do my little home spa days on Fridays because I like to have my, I feel like since Saturday is a day that I'm in my office and Friday is usually my, my Friday is my, my day. Usually I'm, I'm meeting with virtually with my um, intern or meeting in my office with my interns on Fridays. So when I get home from that, I usually do my hair, I do my nails, I do, you know, my toenails and my facial stuff. I try to do that every Friday so that I'm fresh for Saturday when I see my clients. And Saturday is like my Monday to me. So um, it's it's something that I've I've been doing. It's something that I'm continuing to do. I'm just trying to keep normalcy in my life because I need it right now. I need some st- stability. I need rituals. Because that's really what keeps you calm. So make sure that you're doing those things. Okay. Um, this is a difficult time. And I was actually on a live recently. I've been going live lately. And not on my page. If you guys want me to go live, let me know. Drop it in the comments. Tell me that you want me to go live on my page. But I have been going live on like my friends' pages. And shout out to Aunt Marshall. Anthony Marshall of Lyricist Lounge. If you don't know, Google him because he's pretty awesome. But um, he and I was talking about the stages of grief, right? Like a lot of us are grieving. And I've kind of seen that come up before. But I think it's, it's such a great thing to talk about now as it relates to symptoms of COVID. So this is, these are the stages of grief, but I kind of feel like these are stages that we, that replicate, or this is a, um, what is the thing called? A framework that works for a lot of different things in life. And so, um, this can happen to us, whether we are diagnosed, but I kind of think that this is what's happening to us communally. So shock and denial, right, is the first stage. A lot of us were in disbelief when we were told that we needed to self-quarantine or we need to be in the house for 14 days. 14 days is a long time. Two months is a long time. Uh, They're saying that the peak of this may happen in mid-May. It may happen in April. Dwight President is talking about we need to go outside um, what did he say? We need to go out, go outside in Easter. And I started to talk about Jewish people earlier and it, I, I don't clearly, I'm not definitely not anti-Semitic. I have to always say that first before you say anything about Jewish people, but culturally they gather. And in my neighborhood where I live, I've seen a, a lot of them gathering together, which makes sense because I'm I've been going out on the Sabbath, which is a thing, and I've been um shopping in like I said, I live in a intersection of like both neighborhoods. <laughs> so it's either all black people on if I if I take a left and all Jewish people if I take a right, but I'm like in the middle of like the Jewish neighborhood. So I've seen a lot of them gathering. Some of them has been wearing masks, which have made me very, you know, happy. Um, in the black neighborhood, like I said, there's been a lot of social distancing or people wearing masks, but you know, it's been very difficult culturally for a lot of them to not gather. It's been difficult for a lot of black people who are into churches to not gather. I've heard people say stuff like, oh, faith and fear can't, can't exist in the same space. And you are absolutely right that faith and fear cannot exist in the same place but faith without works is dead right so if you if you can take proactive measures to be mindful and to not 
expose other people to a virus that may not kill you or may not harm you or you may not be symptomatic with, but you are spreading it to your grandmother or elderly people around you or old people or people that you love who may be HIV positive or who have immune system issues or who have diabetes, who have high blood pressure, who had cancer, you're kind of a dirtbag. It's just my FYI about that, but it's kind of how I feel. Right. So a lot of us were in shock when we first heard the news. I was definitely in shock to know that Brooklyn has a very high case, but it made sense to me because gentrification is a thing. Um, We're mixing a lot. We live on top of each other. A lot of us have one bathroom. There's not a lot of social isolation that can happen. I've kind of like made peace with it. Like if my son gets it, I'll get it. If he gets it, I'll probably get it. You know, um, if I get it, he'll he'll probably get it because I'm the only one that cleans up in this damn house. But, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's been pretty shocking. And a lot of people have been in denial. And a lot of people have not been protecting themselves as well as we should. A lot of us think that young people can't get it or old people only get it or babies don't get it or you can't get it in hot climates and you can't get it in the summertime. All of that, and as far as I'm concerned, is God's business, right? I can't say who can get it, who can, who won't get it or whatever. I just know that my responsibility in this is to wash my hands, keep my house clean, keep my hands out of my nose and my face, wash my ass. Because <laughs> just, just FYI, you should wash that too. So it's just like, I just know that these are the things that I need to do, right? Pain and guilt. A lot of us will be in pain. If a loved one passes away, if we bring it home to our families, if we infect other people, there will be pain and there will be guilt. If others around us who we didn't infect, if they pass away, right, that's that's a level of of pain that I don't even want to know. I don't even want to think about right now. Right. Anger and bargaining. Hello. We've already seen that because your your man 45 is out there he he don't want he want us outside by april some of these politicians are saying oh your grandmother rather die than stay home and break the economy it's foolishness it's foolishness it's foolishness it's foolishness a a jewish attorney here in new york sued the governor because you know he said that we need to stay home and self-quarantine and practice social distancing. And it's against his religion and it's against um, his freedom of assembly. And it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Go to bedside Baptists like the rest of, oh, well, I guess they're not going to go. Well, bedside synagogue. Right? Like there are, there are ex- extreme times and extreme measures I think somebody was like Anne Frank was in the how long was Anne Frank in the attic? Don't don't be mad at me. I haven't read an Anne Frank book in a while. Anne Frank was in the attic for 25 months. Clearly she was she was Jewish. She wasn't going to synagogue. She was doing what she needed to do to stay alive. Some of us have to do what we need to do to stay alive. That's all I'm saying. The depression, the reflection, and the loneliness. Now, some of us, for some of us, this has already kicked in. Because y'all are home with somebody that you, you don't want to be with. You're home with them kids that, and they bad. Some of them is bad. Some of them don't know how to read. Some of them is doing TikToks. (laughs) Some of us is depressed. And yeah, this money stuff is going to come up. Your insecurities will rise. This thing is going to bring up all of your bad stuff. Housing insecurity, food insecurity, financial insecurity, 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 emotional insecurity. That's what it's called. Um, your your insecure relationships, this is going to bring up your things. And the best way to manage those things is to be proactive. The depression, you have to do what you need to do to learn how to manage it. There are CBD, CBD. 
Don't quote me on that. <laughs> CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Worksheets that are online. You can go and, and download yourself a thought record. If you find yourself ruminating on something, if you find yourself thinking about things, if your internal voice is getting louder and louder and louder because you have more than enough quiet time, write down your thoughts. Call your therapist. Have you a friend? Do online happy hours. Uh, meet your meet your coworkers online. Uh, damn it, I was supposed to do a Zoom this night tonight with my friends, but guess what? I've decided to wash my hair. Well, I'll see them another. I'll see them another time. I drop something, but um, make sure that you are doing what you need to do to reach out to others. Loneliness. If you are lonely. This is the time that this is going to kick up your stuff. If you're not in a relationship right now and you're not happy about it, yet your lonely stuff is going to, to, to come up. Your lonely stuff is going to come up. You might find yourself calling somebody you don't got no business speaking to. That's all right. We may have misunderstand. Sorry, that was, that was D'Angelo. I was listening to some D'Angelo tonight. But listen, do whatever you need to do to get through the time. But please social distance if you can. Now, I'm not telling you to not get your hind parts felt on if that's what you need. But I am telling you, and this is my own PSA, make sure you're doing it for somebody that is worth it. It's, It's worth you getting the coronavirus and having somebody breathe all on your body and stuff. Just be very careful. I don't mean to make light of it. Just be very careful. You know what I'm saying? Make sure that this is somebody that you can at least trust to be safe when he's out in the world or she's out in the world or, or they, whatever you're into. OK. Um, but yeah, this is going to kick up your stuff. This is a good time to build intentional relationships and make intentional connections. Because you got to do a lot more talking than you might normally do in a situation where you just your body is all hot for somebody. Okay, and get creative. Get creative. Um, there's there, this thing's a seven stages of grief. There are seven. There are five. I'm going straight to well here reconstruction and working through. Right, a lot of us are gonna have. have after some time decide that you know what this is a good time I think that this is a great time for you to start planning right I told my mother today my mother was talking about like a business goal that I had I said my listen 2020 is a wash I'll try this again in 2020 2021 right ain't nobody got time to spend money with me on this thing this is not a good time to do this this business idea right now, but this is a great time to lay the foundation for me to plan for what next year will look like so I can do my marketing goals for next year or for this year, right? I have websites that I need to build for myself that I'm, I'm doing. I have strategic planning that I need to do. I have event planning that I have to do. There's, I'm going to do calendar maps. I'm going to plan my social media. I'm going to schedule stuff that I can schedule. I'm going to make some phone calls and some meetings that I could take right now. Like now is the time to plan for your future. And please, please, please do not get caught up in things that you cannot do right now. This thing is permeating every aspect of people's lives. People are rescheduling weddings. They're not able to have baby showers. Up until like today, New York was not allowing other people to come into your hospital room if you were having a baby. and Not your doula, not your partner. That is devastating because anytime that you need somebody else to be your advocate is probably when you're in a hospital. Well, it's a hundred percent when you're in a hospital and definitely when you're in labor, right? We know about the infant mortality rates. We know about the, the mother mortality rates. You need to have somebody there with you. So that changed here, but that's, this is here. Uh, there are, there are people who have loved ones in ICU, who have diagnosed with COVID and they are not allowed to see them. Like this thing is really, 
really bad. It's like stuff that I've never even thought about. And there's a joke in the black community that a black man and probably white guys too, I don't know, but the black man is more faithful to his barber than anybody else. That not being able to go to the barbershop stuff is killing guys on my timeline. Girls not being able to get their nails done. Ha ha. Y'all should do them at home. <laughs> that is killing chicks on my timeline. Right? Not not doing your hair is killing chicks on my timeline. I'm going to be just fine with all of that. But a lot of people are not doing so well out, out here in the world. And so be kind to yourself. You know, this, this, we may be in for the long haul, but, but the best case scenario is that we, we survive this. Best case scenario is that we learn a new skill. Best case, case scenario is that we indulge in a hobby. We take time for ourselves. We slow down. We check in on our loved ones. Like that's the best case scenario in this situation. I want to talk about another thing. So New York State sent me an email stating that they were looking for uh oh, that they were looking for um, mental health providers to help with the COVID response. And they asked for retired mental, they asked for retired everything, right? Therapists, doctors, respiratory therapists, anesthesiologists, nurses, whomever, to come out of retirement to be in this reserve core. And so I got this email. My mother told me about it. They're looking for mental health providers. I read it. I fill it out because I'm a mental health provider, right? Social workers are essential, right? Psychiatrists are out there, but I'm sorry. A lot of psychiatrists don't do my job anymore. They don't provide long-term therapy. I get it. You pay half a million dollars for your degree, you are an MD, you want to prescribe meds, you can see a patient for 15 minutes. If you see a patient for 15 minutes in the eight hour days, that's, you know, four patients per hour, right? I see a patient for 45 minutes, that's one patient per hour. You can make more money than I can make. Clearly it's math, right? So I understand why a lot of psychiatrists don't do therapy now. But I fill this thing out. Governor Cuomo, shout out to him. He don't listen to the show. But um, he says that there are over 40,000, you know, doctors, medical professionals, they fill this thing out. Only 6,000 mental health professionals fill this thing out. Okay. So I read it. It basically stated that they were asking therapists to work for free. For free. Now, a lot of therapists have lost their practice. A lot of therapists have rent that needs to be paid. I'm extremely concerned about my own practice because my partners own the building. That doesn't mean that without the revenue they are going to be able to pay the full mortgage, right? I'm I'm not on the mortgage. They own the place for 20 plus years, but I'm concerned, clearly. Um, I've worked with them to help set up their telemental health platforms, um, working with the interns to do the same. What do you think that they need from me in terms of support? I'm here. Because in terms of like business strategies, marketing, that kind of stuff, I'm really, really good at it. Of course, I'm lending my hand to my own practice, right? But it's scary out there for a lot of us. A lot of mental health therapists, are our practices are struggling. I thank God I'm not in a situation where mine is struggling or mine is struggling to the point that I care. I'll say like I can I can manage my overhead with what I got going on right now. And I have other plans in enacted other things that are going to kick in in a week or two or whatever. 
So I'm not concerned about me, but I know what it's like for the majority of us. We get paid the least. We get the least respect. We get the grunt work. And it's ridiculous. So I sign up for this this course because I'm a I'm a born and bred true blue New Yorker. And so the New York State of Health has this this D- Department of Health call on Friday. I get up, I'm listening to this call. The reimbursement rates for therapy for therapists, if you choose to use insurance with Medicaid and Medicare was like my hourly rate which I don't often get and I don't always get for a 40 minute session is 140 bucks so immediately I'm looking at this like wow this is nuts and then I see that they want to pay nurses $100 an hour. But I think it was more than $100 an hour for their reserve core. I seen a lot of chat in my groups about therapists. And I seen a lot of talk in my groups about why they didn't sign up and how offended they felt because we we too are losing our practices and we too are you know having to cover our overhead and we too are small business owners and why isn't it that you know they're not looking at us to pay us equitably and I, for the mental health professionals black therapists who are listening to me white therapists Asian, whomever, whatever, right? We need to start organizing and lending our voices to the fray. I've been watching the news. I've been watching CNN, MSNBC. I've seen plenty of mentee, a psychiatrist on this show, on these shows. No mental health providers, no social workers, no therapists, Who are suffering. A lot of us are suffering. A lot of us was underwater to begin with. Let's keep it real. A lot of us are not making the money that we're supposed to be making. A lot of us are not making the money up to our potential. Including myself. I'm okay. But that I'm not. I'm not meant to be okay. I'm meant to thrive. A lot of us are not organized. This is the perfect time, and I have an idea of what I'm going to do, but this is the perfect time to discuss with our legislators and advocate for our rights. There are insurance companies that pay me the same rates that they pay providers in 1985. 1985. And there are some providers that mental health, I mean, insurance providers that pay me 90% of what I, what my asking is. Not a lot of them, but there are some. Like we have to start complaining when it's necessary, when they come knocking on our doors and asking us for stuff, that's when we need to organize and be like, wait a minute, hold up, bro. You are paying the doctors this and the anesthesiologist this and this is the, but guess who has to take care of the anesthesiologist and the doctor and the, the hospital administrators when they can't go home to their children because they've been exposed to this virus. Or they can't pay their bills because they were already underwater because they have large student loans and et cetera. And they need somebody to talk to. This emotional labor of being able to support people when there is a crisis emotionally is taxing. And while I love the fact that my mother is volunteering, she's retired and she's up and she's making masks and stuff. And I'm looking at my schedule and I'm like, I can probably do Five free sessions a week. 
That's not what they're asking for. They were asking for shifts. Shifts like 12 to 8. I don't know. I don't remember the time. Don't quote me on that. But they went, uh uh-uh. I don't, I just, I don't have it. Because at the same time, I have to manage my own expectations. I have to manage my own emotions. I have to manage what's going on in my household. I have to save space for my clients. My families and friends, they're, they're looking at me and calling me. I have friends who have coronavirus, so I'm calling them to make sure that they're okay and praying for them. Managing my own feelings. Like it now is the time that we start to think about how we organize and how we advocate for ourselves when these situations happen, because we are on the front lines too. I'm not walking into a burning building. I actually don't even have to go anywhere to treat clients who um, have coronavirus. I'm not putting myself in that kind of risk. But holding space for everybody else's emotions is draining as shit. As a reactive person as I am, I much rather do the busy work. When my father passed away, I didn't get a chance to feel my feelings because I was too busy. I assume that's what it's like working in the ER right now. Because you're so busy treating patients and doing this and doing that and putting out fires that, that you don't have time to deal with your emotions until it's all over with. It's almost like a disassociation. You got to be great at compartmentalizing. That's hard work when you're dealing with everybody's emotional spaces. And right now, people are not going to just need me to be a therapist. They're going to need me to be a full on social worker, which means I would have to manage their expectations. I would have to manage their feelings, thoughts and emotions and put a safe, have a safe space for that. But I would also need to be able to create connections with them so that I can connect them to community resources because people are going to need stuff. They're going to need food. They're going to need housing. They're going to need money. They're going to need resources. That's a lot of work. I ask every therapist out there right now who's at the sound of my voice, if you can volunteer some hours to bank Give what you can. I'm still going to look at my schedule and give what I can. But I also know realistically, things have to change. Because I can no longer keep putting into society more than what they're willing to give me back. Because whenever something happens or it's a tragedy or it's it's a, a failure of morality, it's a failure of proactive systems we are a reactive country and not a proactive country and that is why we are in the situation we are in right now when there's a failure of proper planning mental health agencies are always the scapegoat if there's a school shooting if there's a crazy person killing people if there's a serial killer if there's a good old white boy who went out there and did something retarded. Always blaming on a failing in the mental health system. And never, ever, ever are people putting their money and their movement behind fixing the systems. At some point, we as therapists have to stop complaining about it and we got to get up and do something about it. So do what you can to remain strong and mentally intact for yourself, your clients, and your community. Speaking to the therapists out there. But but get ready to mobilize because we have to make sure that we are willing to take on the fight to change the system. We are advocates for everybody else but ourselves. I did a show maybe a year ago about social workers needing social workers. We are the best at fighting for other people and not for ourselves. We got to start advocating for ourselves maybe right now is not the time to do it or to take that stand 
but it's definitely the time to start having these conversations. Okay. It's been a long episode of Black Therapist Podcast. My shows are usually not an hour long, but hey, I had a lot to say. I want you guys to be well. I want you guys to be safe. We will come out of this better and stronger, but I really want us to come out of this at least with a, the better, a better perspective of how we improve and be kind to ourselves and we be kind to one another. Because it's so needed. Like if I don't, I don't play music on the show, but if you need a, a moment, a great song for this moment right now would be Love's in Need of Love on the Songs in the Key of Life by Stevie Wonder. Okay? Take care. And please, please, you and your families be well. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Black Therapist Podcast. Once again, you can follow us on all our social media sites at Black Therapist Podcast on Instagram and on Twitter, as well as Black in Therapy on Facebook. Or you can follow your host, me, Miss M-S-N-I-K-I, thanks, on Instagram and Twitter, as well as you can find out any information about me at Nikita, N-I-K-I-T-A, banks.com, and on the show website blacktherapistpodcast.com and don't forget if you want to send us any general feedback show suggestions uh, show topics or guest ideas please feel free to drop us an email at blacktherapistpodcast at gmail.com thank you be well